Hey guys, in this video, the lovely team is going to be talking to you about recent Prime Ministers. Now, there are lots of names and dates and which party they were for that you need to remember in this. So to help you remember everything over on my website, there are loads of multiple choice questions just waiting for you. A common question with GCSE citizenship is how much do I need to know about past Prime Ministers? Specifics about Prime Ministers and UK political history are not on specifications, be that AQA, OCR or Edexcel. And any specific information that you need will likely be given to you in sources within the exam. However, a good background knowledge is key to understanding events. To make more sense about the events you're talked about in your citizenship specification, things like elections, the process in Parliament and how Prime Ministers carry out their role all of that will make more sense if you have a knowledge of how Prime Ministers have done it. Having background knowledge allows you to write convincingly and coherently about the subject. If you are especially struggling with long answer questions, one way to improve that grade is to get yourself a better background knowledge. Political history is a very good preparation if you are intending or considering continuing on your studies of politics and citizenship onto AS or A level. A fact worth mentioning is that many elections and the conduct of Prime Ministers is publicly available information. Election nights are repeatedly rebroadcast on channels like BBC Parliament. Documentaries are available on things like BBC Four. Another question is that if I do go back, how far back do I need to go? How many Prime Ministers do I need to look at? This is obviously a subjective question. However, it is unlikely you are going to be asked to look at Prime Ministers before about 1980. I start this process here today with Jim Callaghan, who became Prime Minister in 1976 and lasted until 1979. I very much doubt you will need to go back further than that. If you want to compress the process, one way to look at it is to go back to 1997, which in many ways marks the start of modern Prime Ministers. James Callaghan, often known as Jim Callaghan, was Prime Minister from 1976 to 1979. Harold Wilson, his predecessor in the Labour Party, won an election rather unexpectedly in 1974. To increase his majority, he took another election in 1974, slightly later in the year, but decided in 1976, upon his 60th birthday, that it was time to resign. Harold Wilson did resign in 1976, and as a result, a leadership election was called within the Labour Party. James Callaghan, who was seen as a balanced, progressive but moderate candidate in the centre of the party, won the leadership election to replace Harold Wilson. He therefore became both leader of the Labour Party and Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. He attempted to balance economic progress and a reasonably growing economy with the rights of workers and the representatives in their trade unions. Unfortunately for him, he led the government with a very slim majority and was often reliant on the small Liberal Party for support. Because of this problem, he suffered repeated crisis and industrial disputes. Because general strikes were able to effectively bring down the government and drive things to a halt, they were useful tools for trade unions seeking change. This crisis reached a peak in what was popularly called the Winter of Discontent in 1978-1979. Many people who remember this time remember it as a particularly terrible one, with rubbish and bodies piling up in the streets as the litter collectors and grave diggers had gone on strike. Because of limited fuel output, electricity was on limited hours. The lights went off usually at 10 o'clock at night. There was usually a three-day working week through this period as well, with people not always able to go to work. This had further economic impacts. This cemented Mr Callaghan's reputation as being economically illiterate, despite having a reasonably successful time as Chancellor of the Exchequer in his own right. Overall, it convinced many people that the Labour government of the time were unable to govern. Eventually, a vote of no confidence was called in the House of Commons, really on the machinations of the new leader of the opposition, Margaret Thatcher, who'd been elected to leader of the Conservative Party in 1975. After this process, the 1979 election was triggered. James Callaghan lost this election and ceased being Prime Minister in 1979. He didn't remain politically active. However, one thing worth noting is that James Callaghan was the last Labour leader until 1997. He's not fondly remembered by many people within the Labour Party, some of whom on the left of the party accuse him of selling out. What Mr Callaghan did try to do is to bring the Labour Party back to the relevant political centre, which he struggled with. He had repeated disputes with the trade unions in a way which his predecessor didn't always have and is not therefore always regarded as a particularly successful Prime Minister. Margaret Thatcher took over from James Callaghan in 1979 following the general election. She remained as Prime Minister from 1979 to 1990. She was obviously a key figure of the 1980s within the United Kingdom, and indeed a whole new wave of conservative ideology known as Thatcherism followed in her wake. 
Mrs. Thatcher was the first female Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. The UK has had two female Prime Ministers. She was the first. She led a government with a large majority throughout her time in office, certainly a large enough majority to get the business she wanted to do through the House. She initiated combative trade union and economic reforms that were not always or even often popular. In particular, she suffered terribly with the miners. She struck a pose with them that many considered to be combative, leading to pit closures and economic reformers of the mining sector. Many miners went on strike, and the miners' strike marked the early years of her prime ministership. Many people, especially in the North today, remember her with great vitriol for how she and her government conducted the miners' strike. However, many other people consider that she stood up to a combative trade union. Privatisation of industry was another controversial policy throughout Margaret Thatcher's time in office. Many key UK industries were privatised, such as the rail network and, and telephone service. Opinion is debating still as to how wise this was. Some have been commercially successful, but the impact upon the consumer is a more controversial idea. Mrs Thatcher is regarded as taking the country to the right of politics, leading to more economic freedom, but less support for the less well-off in society. In 1982, in the Falklands War, Margaret Thatcher defeated Argentina as head of the UK Armed Forces, as the Prime Minister always is. She was widely credited in 1982 with the victory over Argentina in the Falklands War and decided in 1983 to call an election, where she got an increased majority and an increased mandate to push on with what she saw as useful reforms. In 1987, at the next election, she won again, albeit with a slightly reduced majority. In 1990, Margaret Thatcher was eventually removed from office by her own party in a leadership contest. In 1985, a key figure in her cabinet, Michael Heseltine, had stormed out over a minor dispute at the Ministry of Defence. She had known, therefore, for some time that Mr Heseltine, who was widely popular in the Conservative Party, would be planning a leadership contest. In 1990, she was suffering increasing difficulties over Europe, with many senior figures in the cabinet advocating membership of what was known then as the ERM. She disagreed and was forced to fire and reshuffle a number of key people. Sensing her weakness, Mr. Heseltine challenged her in 1990. Many people in the Conservative Party considered that it was her dictatorial style and refusal to compromise, which eventually, eventually brought her downfall. No general election precipitated the removal of Margaret Thatcher from office after 11 years in government. Instead, it was her own party which voted her out. After winning the first ballot, but not by a large enough margin to win outright, she knew she would have to go for a second ballot. Many of the MPs who had supported her in that first ballot would no longer feel bound to do so, and she and her advisers knew there was a more than average prospect she would lose it. She therefore decided not to stand and supported her chosen successor, John Major, who duly went on to win. In 1990, John Major won the leadership election to succeed Margaret Thatcher, and he remained as Prime Minister until 1997. He therefore became Prime Minister without a general election as a result of winning this leadership election. John Major was and is regarded as a moderate, one-nation conservative rather than a divisive right-wing figure. He was frustrated by repeated division inside the Conservative Party over Europe, the issue that had also brought down his predecessor. Mr Major was regarded as much less divisive and combative. He didn't seek to divide and rule his cabinet as his predecessor had done. Instead, he sought to build consensus. Even today, Major is regarded as an honest man, somebody who did his best in difficult circumstances, and he's widely popular even outside of his own party. In 1992, Labour were higher than the Conservatives in the polls at the start of the election. However, as election day dawned, it became clear that it was possible that John Major would win. In particular, Labour held a rally in Sheffield just prior to the election day, which was widely condemned as being triumphalist and shifted many votes away from Neil Kinnock, the Labour leader, and to John Major. As a result, with a huge vote to the Conservatives, although a smaller and reduced majority, John Major won the 1992 election. After 1992, things became exceptionally difficult for Mr Major. His party was increasingly divided over Europe. He had to stand himself in a leadership contest in 1995 in an effort to get the rebels to shut up. As 1997 neared, and the Labour Party was ever more resurgent under Tony Blair, an aura of sleaze became attached to the Conservative Party, with multiple scandals. In the 1997 election, Major lost the Prime Ministership and lost the Conservative Party a great number of seats, then being reduced to 165. He did, however, continue to be active outside politics, especially in the debate around Brexit and Scottish independence. Following the 1997 election, in which Labour gained a huge majority, Tony Blair became Prime Minister, the first Labour Prime Minister since 1979. He lasted in the role for 10 years, almost to the day, resigning in 2007. The 1997 election represented a huge swing in British politics away from the Conservatives and towards a centrist new Labour government. 
He was credited as taking Labour and the country to the centre in what was known as Blairism or third way politics. In doing so, Mr Blair gained the support of much of the middle classes. He was able to win subsequent elections at 2001 and 2005, in each case with a large majority. Mr Blair now is primarily remembered for the 2003 Iraq war, which was then and now deeply controversial. Many people do consider that Mr Blair did commit war crimes in lying about going into Iraq. However, Mr Blair also had other foreign policy achievements, primarily a peace in Northern Ireland and affairs in Kosovo around the same time. Mr Blair's most memorable moment, and the one in which many people think he struck the best tone, was after the death of Princess Diana. Mr Blair became increasingly beleaguered through his time in office, and his relationship with his Chancellor Gordon Brown gradually deteriorated until the point where the two men could barely be in the same room. Mr Brown was obviously positioning himself to succeed Blair. Calls for Mr Blair's resignation gradually increased through 2006 and 2007, until eventually, in 2007, he announced his resignation. As he did so, Mr Brown took over as his appointed successor. Mr Blair's image has clearly been compromised by the Iraq war and the rumours and scandals surrounding it. However, he is still remembered as a Prime Minister who made many achievements and greatly modernised Britain. Following Tony Blair's resignation in 2007, Gordon Brown became Prime Minister, a role he was in for three years. He was elected in in a Labour leadership election, unopposed by anyone else after that resignation. He had been Chancellor of the Exchequer from 1997 through to 2007. He was widely regarded as dull but competent, having been a good Chancellor through this period. Britain's economy had been gradually increasing and improving, although it was also acknowledged that part of the credit should go to his predecessor, Kenneth Clark. In 2008, not long after Mr Brown took office, there was a massive financial crash. He was widely praised for his handling of this, although it did cement Labour's reputation, which has continued to this day, of high tax, high spending, which has certainly cost them votes. Gordon Brown was defeated in the 2010 general election, although not by much. It became clear as election night progressed that a hung parliament was in order, and like the Conservatives, Mr Brown opened up negotiations with the Liberal Democrats in an attempt to form a coalition government. He was regarded by many people as a caretaker prime minister who didn't change much and didn't achieve much. However, he did very definitely pursue his own agenda. After leaving office, Mr Brown was very active in the 2014 Scottish independence referendum. He is generally regarded as having been a relatively safe prime minister. And as with many short term prime ministers, his reputation has improved after he has left office. Following the 2010 general election, there was a hung parliament. Negotiations immediately opened between the Liberal Democrats and Conservatives, the two main opposition parties to Labour. They were able to strike an agreement and form a coalition government. So even though Mr Cameron did not quite get an overall majority in the 2010 election, he was able to form that coalition government. In 2015, he won a second general election, this time with an outright majority, and was able to govern without the help of the Liberal Democrats. Mr Cameron is regarded as a moderate Conservative who took his party towards the centre from the rightward tilt it it had had during Thatcher years. Mr Cameron is regarded as a social liberal, somebody more akin to the left on social issues. A key example of that would be the Equal Marriage Act in 2012-13, which allowed homosexual couples to marry fully in the UK. Part of the 2015 general election pledge from the Conservatives was that they would have an EU referendum. There were a number of reasons for this, but the primary one is that UKIP, the UK Independence Party, had been gradually sapping votes for the Conservatives by demanding a UK referendum on the EU. Mr Cameron therefore included a commitment to that referendum in his general election promises, known as a manifesto, and in due course in 2016 that happened. Many figures on the Remain side, including Mr Cameron, were confident of a Remain victory in that that referendum. However, as the actual results unfolded, it became clear that however narrowly, Leave had won, and regardless of the reasons. Mr Cameron was unprepared and not willing to be the Prime Minister who guided the UK out of the European Union. He had been Prime Minister for six years, which he regarded as possibly enough, and he had already announced that he would not seek a third term. So he resigned, triggering a Conservative leadership election. And once again, a new Prime Minister took over without having first had a general election. One of the most controversial set of decisions that Mr Cameron made through his time in office was to pursue a programme of austerity after the financial crash, where taxes and public services were both cut in an effort to get the economy back up and running, more akin to as it has been in the early 2000s. However, in doing so, this led to inevitable and drastic cuts in public services, things like education provision and local councils. In doing so, Mr Cameron cemented the Tories' authority on the economy as being a party of the right, of economic liberalism. However, he was also, as we have talked about, a social liberal. 
Following Mr Cameron's resignation, Theresa May, who had been Home Secretary from 2010 to 2016, became Prime Minister, winning the Conservative leadership election. She had previously been regarded as a tough Home Secretary and a competent, safe pair of hands. However, her premiership between 2016 and 2019 was dominated by Brexit. In trying to implement the referendum result, she tried to strike a balance between the Brexiteer wing of her party and the more moderate left wing of her party. In doing so, she managed to alienate both wings of the Conservative Party, both of which tried to call for her resignation. Despite trying to stand strong and resist these calls for quite a long time, she eventually had to announce her resignation in 2019. In 2017, in order to gain an increased mandate and a bigger majority, Theresa May called a general election. Upon calling it, she was many points ahead in the opinion polls and was initially confident of victory. However, as the general election campaign progressed, the Conservative lead over Labour gradually declined to a point where they were not entirely confident that they would be returned as the government. As it happened, they did scrape through, although with a very small majority. Indeed, to continue on as their government, they had to seek a confidence and supply informal arrangement to support the government from the Democratic Unionist Party, a party on the right of Northern Ireland politics. However, in doing this, Mrs May was able to continue until 2019. At this point, she realised that she, in her consideration, no longer had the ability to drive through the Brexit that she wished and would make way for someone else to do this. So she resigned, triggering a second Conservative leadership election. Following this leadership election in 2019, Boris Johnson, who is the incumbent Prime Minister, took over after winning the Conservative leadership election. He later called a general election in 2019 in December, winning a majority. Boris Johnson is regarded as a right-wing populist conservative, pursuing policies which are popular with the general public, regardless of what the facts or experience say, such as limiting immigration and the more hardline Brexit. Indeed, his campaign through that election was on the issue of Brexit, with a clear focus on we must leave as soon as possible. His administration in the early days was therefore dominated by the issue of Brexit and attempting to make it happen. However, at the time of writing for the past month or so, his administration has instead been dominated by the COVID-19 pandemic and the mixed reports on how well he is dealing with it. Mr Johnson has been personally popular with the electorate, having been on quiz shows and a member of the media for some years, as well as an author on a number of historical figures. He is therefore personally popular, which adds to his populist rhetoric. However, questions have been raised about Mr Johnson's factual honesty in his election tactics and the election tactics themselves as promoted by his chief advisor, Mr Dominic Cummings. It is therefore likely that following the end of the COVID-19 pandemic, Mr Johnson's administration will continue to be dominated by Brexit. At this point, it is too soon to say what kind of prime minister he may be.